Only two atomic bombs have ever been used in warfare. What would it have been like to live in Hiroshima or Nagasaki during the bombings? What was life like for the survivors afterwards? And what was the US's real motivation for using the bombs? In this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be looking at the atomic bombings that changed the world forever. I honestly have the feeling of groping for words to explain this, or I might say, my God, what have we done? This is what Robert A. Lewis, co-pilot of the plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima wrote about how he felt watching the mushroom cloud grow from the air. The plane he was flying was a B-29 bomber named Enola Gay, after the mother of the pilot. The most famous pictures of the bomb's impact were taken by the tail gunner, George Karen, whose descriptions of the bomb make it sound like something from science fiction. It looks like bubbling molasses, let's say, spreading out and running up into the foothills, just covering the whole city. When you think about the atomic bomb, the mushroom cloud is most likely what comes to mind. But that's not at all what it would have looked like if you were on the ground in Hiroshima or Nagasaki when the atomic bombs were dropped. Shinji Mikamo, a survivor, described his experience like this. Suddenly, I was facing a gigantic fireball. It was at least five times bigger and ten times brighter than the sun. It was hurtling directly towards me, a powerful flame that was a remarkable pale yellow, almost the color of white. He and others who survived say that what followed was a loud boom and then a sensation like that of being totally doused with boiling water. Shinji says he then found himself buried underneath the rubble of his house, which was also typical since the atomic bombs leveled most of the buildings in both cities. Many Japanese people report that a sticky black rain fell after this that could not be washed off with water. Part of the reason the atomic bombs were so devastating in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was that the cities had a lot of buildings that were made primarily of wood. These buildings were utterly incinerated in the blast and resulting firestorms, which could have caused the black rain reported. However, the atomic blasts were less destructive to other types of buildings than you might think. Some of the buildings in Hiroshima were made of reinforced concrete and were very sturdily constructed because of the danger of earthquakes in Japan. These buildings survived, even though some were very close to the blast center. The atomic bombs were detonated 2,000 feet above the ground to maximize the blast potential. The prefectural industrial promotional hall in Hiroshima survived, even though it was a mere 500 feet from ground zero. A man named Ezo Numura was the survivor of the bombings who was the closest to the blast. He was in the basement of a reinforced concrete building at the time, just 560 feet away from ground zero. He lived to be 84. A woman named Akiko Takakura, who was in the bank of Hiroshima, survived the blast despite being just a thousand feet away. Almost all of the doctors and nurses in Hiroshima were either killed or injured because the bomb exploded over the downtown area where the hospitals were. The hospitals themselves were either totally destroyed or heavily damaged. There was only one doctor, Terufumi Sasaki, on duty at the Red Cross Hospital in the immediate aftermath. This, of course, made the entire situation that much worse. Survivors of the blast would try to walk to the hospitals, but many would drop dead before they could even get there, so the buildings were ringed with charred corpses. Unbeknownst to most people, the atomic bombs killed some Americans as well. There were 12 American airmen who were prisoners at the Chugoku Military Police Headquarters at the time, about 1,300 feet away from the blast. Most of them died instantly. Two of them were reported to have been executed by their captors, most likely as a kind of instant revenge. Two others were badly injured by the bomb, but survived. They were left next to a bridge and then stoned to death. The Japanese officers must have needed an immediate outlet for the rage they felt at having been attacked with what to them was essentially a science fiction weapon of horror. Eight other US prisoners of war were reported to have been killed by the bomb at Kyushu University, but this was actually an attempted cover-up by the Japanese government, and they had in fact been killed as part of medical experiments. Between 129,000 and 226,000 people total died as a result of the bombings. Somewhere around 260,000 people survived the atomic bombs. Some people, like Tsutomu Yamaguchi, actually survived both bombs. He was 29 years old in 1945 and worked at Mitsubishi a few miles away from the blast. He suffered severe burns and his eardrums were ruptured, but he survived. That night, he stayed in an air raid shelter with other survivors, then went to the train station in the morning. He had to swim through a river full of dead bodies in order to get to the train and head back home to Nagasaki. There, he got treated by a doctor who happened to be a former classmate of his. He was so badly burned that the doctor didn't even recognize him. When the second bomb hit Nagasaki, he happened to be briefing his boss about what had happened in Hiroshima. Not only did he survive this second blast, but his family did as well. His wife was buying burn cream for him when the bomb dropped, and so she wasn't inside their home when it collapsed. 
Tsutomu wasn't alone in surviving both blasts. It's thought that around 165 people survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there's even a specific term for them in Japanese, Nijiu Hibokusha, which translates to the twice-bombed person. Many survivors were not as lucky as Tsutomu and suffered gruesome and brutal injuries. Shinji Makamo spoke about his initial injuries, saying, My skin hung off my body in pieces, like ragged clothes. He said that the flesh underneath the skin that had peeled away was a strange yellow color, and he remembered thinking that it reminded him of a type of cake his mom liked to make. It's strange how the brain can remain calm enough to make those kinds of comparisons, even in the direst of circumstances. Shinji also described leaving the city. My feet were charred and clumsy. Every step or so, I would unintentionally hit an arm or a leg and hear the person below me wince in pain. I felt like a vulture, crossing that bridge and leaving all those wounded people behind to die. It's easy to imagine the survivor's guilt that would most likely haunt you for the rest of your life. Sumiteru Taniguchi, who was 16 when Nagasaki was bombed, had been delivering mail on his bike at the time. He survived, but his injuries were almost unthinkably bad. He said, The skin of my left arm, from the shoulder to the tip of my fingers, was dripping like rags. I put my hand to my back, but there was no clothing. I could feel something slimy. What he was feeling was his own back without any skin on it. He somehow survived, even though he wasn't taken to a Japanese military hospital until months later. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey actually filmed his treatment and recovery for scientific purposes, but the footage was hidden for decades because of how brutal it was. He spent three years laying on his stomach while his back healed. He developed bed sores that were so deep, doctors could see his heart beating in his chest. Sumiteru went on to become a public advocate of non-proliferation for nuclear arms and spoke at the UN. The people who survived the atomic bombs became known as Hibokusha, which roughly translates to person affected by a bomb, or person affected by radioactivity. Their problems didn't end when their wounds healed because they were heavily discriminated against in Japanese society. Radioactivity wasn't well understood at the time, and so people thought that by associating with these survivors, you could actually get radiated yourself. Survivors found it more difficult to find jobs and would sometimes try to keep their past hidden to avoid judgment. It even affected who you could marry, as some people wouldn't marry anyone who had survived the blasts over fear of contamination. In order to make their new weapon even more dangerous and mysterious, the U.S. actively suppressed information about radiation, making it all the more difficult to treat survivors. The military would confiscate photographs, film, and even medical case notes and biopsy slides. This information would have helped Japanese doctors treat people, but instead it went back to America and was strictly classified. They restricted criticizing American activities in post-war Japan and even denied that there were lasting effects from the radiation. Perhaps the biggest misconception about the atomic bombs is that they ended the war. The reality is that this isn't entirely the case, although they certainly sped up the process. While the bombs may have been a factor, the biggest thing that tipped the scales was the Soviet Union entering the war against Japan. Before, they had a non-aggression pact with Japan. Japan had hoped that they might become an intermediary and help them negotiate a better peace deal with America and the Allies. Some argue that the real reason atomic bombs were used on Japan was as a way for the U.S. to intimidate the Soviet Union, who they already knew would be their next enemy after World War II was finished. Had the Soviets entered the war in Japan and been a part of fighting on the island, they would have had leverage to divide Japan the same way Germany was being divided. The U.S. wanted to avoid this at all costs, but also wanted to avoid their own loss of life that would have come from a large-scale invasion of the Japanese mainland. Whatever the motivations were, it is clear the bombs paved the way to Japanese surrender. In 1898, Nikola Tesla said, You may live to see man-made horrors beyond your comprehension. It's easy to see what he meant when you look at the effects of the atomic bomb being dropped four decades later. While we'll never know for certain what the motivation was for using them, the atomic bombs have left a permanent mark not just on Japan, but on the world. Over the years, nuclear bombs have proliferated and evolved into both much more destructive and smaller tactical versions. Thankfully, they have never been used again in wartime, but the threat certainly remains as dangerous as ever. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.